When Final Fantasy VIII arrived back in 1999, it arrived hot on the heels of the biggest game Square had ever produced. It was called Final Fantasy VII, and its success had a significant impact on what would follow. In Japan, Final Fantasy VII's performance wasn't too much of a surprise as the franchise was seeing a pretty natural progression at the time. There had been a steady increase in sales with every single main numbered iteration since the first game had arrived back in 1987, so Final Fantasy VII's record numbers were pretty much par for the course. It was the rest of the world where Square saw a huge impact. They had tried releasing a handful of earlier games in the United States, but the returns were often pretty lacklustre, and Sakaguchi recently had to clarify that Final Fantasy VI, contrary to popular belief, actually sold really badly in their opinion when it released back in 1994. Final Fantasy VII was the exact opposite, and it achieved a monumental shift in performance compared to the previous game. And this was thanks to changes that they had made to make it more appealing to Western audiences, but also the not so discreet marketing budget of up to $100 million. It meant that for the first time in the history of the franchise, sales in Japan were less than those from foreign markets. This heaped a ton of expectation on Final Fantasy VIII, as Yoshinori Kitase and his team realised that they had to not only use their next game to cement the foothold that they had gained, but to also try and grow it even further, something they achieved in some regards, but not others. As you can imagine, this means there are plenty of morsels of information surrounding the creation of the game, as well as hidden details that reside within the final product, and we're going to be delving into some of them today. The hope is that the ones we've selected are insightful on multiple levels beyond just the headline, and that's the main criteria we've tried to base it on. Is there an interesting insight or angle to the wider story? And that's why we won't be talking in too much detail about things like the fact that when he was creating Squall, Tetsuya Nomura was heavily inspired by the actor River Phoenix to the point that they even share the same birthday, or that some people on the motion capture team were such big fans of Michael Jackson that they decided to have dancers during the parade for Sorceress Adia that takes place in Dealing City perform the Thriller Dance. And that's why our first fact relates to something that had never happened before and has never happened since in the history of the Final Fantasy franchise, at least to our knowledge. And it relates to the music being changed for the Siege of Dolet. Prior to the release of Final Fantasy VIII, as they had done for Final Fantasy VII, Square released a demo that allowed prospective gamers around the world to take an early glimpse at the final product. In Japan and North America, this came packed in with the release of Brave Fensu Musashi, while in Europe, you could play the demo after purchasing special editions of official PlayStation magazine that focused on the upcoming release of the game. In North America, you could also obtain the demo if you ordered pizza from Pizza Hut, the demo was featured on the PlayStation demo discs that were given away as part of a promotional campaign that they were running with Sony. Anyway, for those who played this demo, you will probably remember that there were numerous differences when compared to the final product. For example, the character levels were rather inflated, you had access to Guardian forces, the party setup was different, and Squall's design was also altered. Quistis also wasn't the one who was responsible for destroying XATM092. But perhaps the biggest difference came with the music that played throughout all of the demo. The landing is now one of the most recognisable pieces of music composed by Noburo Uematsu, but things could have been rather different had the original piece of music called Raid on Dolet been used instead. Thematically and structurally, the two pieces are very similar, but it's speculated that there was a potential issue with Raid on Dollar. It featured a short passage that was remarkably similar to one that also featured in the main theme of The Rock, which was composed by Hans Zimmer and Nick Glennie Smith for the Hollywood movie starring Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage. Take a listen for yourself to see what you think. Now, there's never been any official confirmation as to why the pieces were actually switched, but to my knowledge, outside of this specific incident, 
neither Square nor Square Enix have ever released a piece of music for a Final Fantasy game pre-launch only to completely change it for the final release. They've modified pieces, sure, as they did with the music that appeared in the Final Fantasy VII demo, but never completely changed it. If that's not the case, then please do let me know in the comments because I would love to know. Our next fact relates to Sir Laguna, the Timber Maniacs, and how acting upon this particular side quest at specific times in the game can lead to alterations when Laguna's flashbacks happen. As part of the game's wider exposition, we learnt that in the past Laguna decided to sign up as a journalist for the Timber Maniacs, a publishing house based in Timber, as he found out that they were interested in publishing more articles about events around the world. These can be collected on your travels, but as you search around for these works of literary genius, there are some important things to note as what you collect and when you collect it will change various scenes that occur in Laguna's flashbacks. The first instance of this relates to the first Laguna flashback, specifically the scene in Julia's room. This is linked to the Timber Maniacs volume that can be found in Balam, but there are different paths here as there are actually two versions of the volume that can be found in the town. If you choose to pick up the volume at the train station, then Laguna will just act as he normally would had you not picked up anything. He'll talk too much and embarrass himself a little. However, if you pick up the volume in the hotel before the first Laguna flashback happens, then he'll be affected by the wine they drink and end up falling asleep on Julia's bed. Some of Kuros' dialogue will also change, and what you choose to pick up will also change the entry that appears on Selfie's Sir Laguna webpage. The other instance relates to the fourth Laguna flashback, where Laguna squares off against the Ruby Dragon. If you pick up the Timber Maniacs volume in the Shumi village before this flashback, then it will also be altered, as Ward won't show up to offer assistance alongside Kiros. Our third fact relates to characters, specifically that some of the more prominent antagonists who appear in Final Fantasy VIII weren't originally designed for the game they ended up appearing in. Thanks to interviews with the development team, we know that Adia Kramer and both Fujin and Raijin were designed for use in Final Fantasy VII, but were shelved and then reused for Final Fantasy VIII due to changes the staff made with the game's narrative. In Adia's case, the snippet of information came from an interview that Famitsu conducted with Yoshinori Kitase where they were speaking about earlier iterations of Final Fantasy VII. Kitase revealed that when they were in pre-planning for Final Fantasy VII, one of the characters that had been proposed for use in the game by Nomura was a witch. However, as Chrono Trigger ended up running into some serious development trouble, many members of staff were called in to help, and as a result, work on Final Fantasy VII was put on hold. When they returned to work on it again when Chrono Trigger had wrapped up, the development team decided to make substantial changes to the game, and the witch character was deemed surplus to requirements. One of the main reasons for this is likely to have been the complexity of the concept itself. Nomura's earlier concepts for Final Fantasy VII were much more elaborate, as he was actually trying to emulate the work that Yoshitaka Amano had produced for earlier iterations. But the team realised that due to the graphical constraints they were working with, these elaborate designs couldn't be accommodated for, and so Nomura worked on making his concepts much more plain. When Final Fantasy VIII rolled around, this wasn't so much of a concern anymore due to the increased graphical capabilities, and so, as he'd actually liked the design and her concept now worked with the narrative they were working on, Kataze proposed using the witch character again. Both Fujin and Raijin were also designed for Final Fantasy VII by Nomura, but after he proposed their inclusion into the game, the wider team felt they were too similar to the Turks and decided to opt against using them. They instead appeared alongside Sifa as part of the Balam Garden Disciplinary Committee. Our next fact takes a slightly different tact as it relates to a secret meter that's present during Zell's love quest. In order to obtain additional moves for Zell to use in his limit break, you'll need to collect various issues of Combat King magazine. The majority of them are pretty easy to obtain as you play through the game, but if you're feeling lazy you can just buy them from the Esther bookstore should you wish. If you aren't feeling lazy and choose to be more adventurous, then obtaining Combat King Issue 3 involves undertaking a quest that revolves around a budding relationship between the oblivious Zell and his secret admirer, the affectionately named Library Girl with a Pigtail. The interesting thing about the quest is that the amount of dialogue you receive at the end of it is based on a secret meter which in the context of the game basically measures how interested you are in the two of them hooking up. To achieve the best result, 
You need to visit the library 8 specific times throughout the course of the game, with the first scene taking place right at the start of the game and the final scene taking place after the Battle of the Gardens. But that's not all, as there's also another hidden requirement on top of this. You also need to have visited the library over 50 times before the quest ends just to show how much you care. Doing so will then mean your love meter score ends up being 5 out of 5, and the cutscene you then witness between Zell and the library girl with the pigtails at the Balam Hotel won't have any missing dialogue. Yay! Our fifth fact relates to the creation of Renoa Hartley as the game's deuteragonist, and compared to some of the other stories on this list, this one is a little bit more unique. I think we can all agree that inspiration can be found in many things, ranging from nature to various entertainment mediums, and Tetsuya Nomura has spoken previously about taking inspiration from movies and magazines, hence why River Phoenix was used as the inspiration for Squall. Nomura also revealed at the Monaco Anime Gaming International Conference in 2017 that when he was struggling to visualise lightning, he ended up attending a lot of fashion shows for inspiration, and at one specific show, he saw a model that had pink blonde hair, and the rest, as they say, was history. But Renoa, she's a rather different case, as her creation was said to be directly inspired by someone Nomura actually knew personally. Specifically, a female co-worker who also had a dog that served as the inspiration for Angelo. Now, there's no official source for this one, but it's something that has permeated out of Square Enix for years. And this led to its appearance on the Rebelling Princess website, which was created by Sheila Knight. Due to her passion for Final Fantasy VIII and Renoa, she claims to have become friends with employees who worked on the game and has intense knowledge of the subject. You could choose to chalk this up as hearsay, so whether you choose to believe this is up to you. As a bonus fact though, this might also explain why Renoa is actually the strongest character in the game. Without taking into consideration any stat manipulation, at level 10 Renoa starts out with around 10% more stat points than any other playable character, and by level 100 this has increased to almost 20% in some cases. She also has the highest strength and magic stats by a country mile. Now, Square has never attempted to hide their love for Star Wars, and allusions to the famed sci-fi film franchise have been appearing under various guises ever since Final Fantasy II. And with Final Fantasy VIII, they set a new record in this regard, as there were five characters who appeared that were named in direct reference to the Star Wars universe, and this was, and I believe still is, more than any other game. The most obvious pairing here is Biggs and Wedge. They are a tribute to two members of the Rebel Alliance called Biggs Darklighter and Wedge Antilles, and they first appeared in Final Fantasy VI. Since then, they have been a mainstay in character rosters, appearing in every single numbered game with the exception of Final Fantasy IX, and even being retroactively added into Final Fantasy IV thanks to the after years. In Final Fantasy VIII, they took on the role of being bumbling members of the Galbadian army and were fought twice throughout the course of the game. Next is Nida, whose name is a nod to Lorth Nida, the unfortunate Lieutenant Commander who loses the Millennium Falcon and gets choked to death by Darth Vader. In Final Fantasy VIII, Nida passes the seed exam at the beginning of the game alongside Squall, Selfie and Zell, and later becomes the pilot of Balam Garden. Then there's Piet, whose name is a nod to another Imperial officer, Admiral Firmus Piet, who ends up commanding Darth Vader's flagship, the Executor. In Final Fantasy VIII, Piet is stationed on the Lunar Base and holds the position of Head Researcher there. The fifth character is Martin, but the tribute isn't with his English name. In Japanese, Martin is called Dodonna, a tribute to Jan Dodonna of the Rebel Alliance, but while he was called that in the Japanese and then Spanish, German and Italian versions, in French and English, for some reason his name was changed to Martin. In Final Fantasy VIII, Martin, or Dodonna, acts as the headmaster of Galbadia Garden and is responsible for helping to set in motion the assassination attempt against Sorceress Adia in Dealing City. In terms of other illusions, well, some point to the Shimi tribe and Nork in particular as a tribute to Jabba the Hutt, but that seems a little bit more tenuous. For our final fact, we're going to take a look at the wildly popular car game that debuted in Final Fantasy VIII, Triple Triad. It was conceived and implemented by Kentaro Yasui, who was a programmer on Final Fantasy VII and had been promoted to battle programmer on Final Fantasy VIII. 
As a side note here, more recently, Yasui had actually worked his way up to being the lead programmer on Final Fantasy XV until he made waves by quitting Square Enix to work on a free-to-play mobile title called Chaos Centurions. Anyway, as Guitarza explained to official PlayStation Magazine back in 2001, when they were conceptualising Triple Triad, they looked at Japanese culture for inspiration. Their main objective was to find something that could keep people occupied for segments of the game when cutscenes were a bit sparse, and as trading card games were incredibly popular at the time, they figured it would be a good fit. The tale told about its in-game creation is a little bit more creative though, as the creator of Triple Triad doesn't even exist within the same realm of school and the rest of the cast, instead he resides in Ivalice. During the tutorial for Triple Triad, it stated that the person who invented the game was a man called Orlan, a psychic who made Triple Triad cards by modifying tarot cards. Now that's not too revolutionary in itself, but alongside this tale was a picture of people playing the game, and one of them was Orlan. Upon closer inspection, Orlan can be identified as Oran Durai from Final Fantasy Tactics, which of course was releasing just as Final Fantasy VIII was starting up with its development. So yeah, they were 7 facts about Final Fantasy VIII that you probably didn't know, and we threw in lots of little bonus facts to you for good measure, but I'm pretty sure that there are still some amongst you who knew them all. Let us know in the comments below though which ones you found more interesting, and of course if you enjoyed the video, please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Before I sign off, I just want to say a really big thank you to everyone who continues to watch our content and carries on watching right to the end. Yeah, I'm talking about you guys listening right now. You're awesome! We try our best to create high quality content and it wouldn't be possible without your support. It also wouldn't be possible without our wonderful Patreon supporters who you're seeing on the screen right now. If you've ever considered becoming a Patreon supporter, there are a few different wards available from the shout out wall you're seeing right now through to the ability to suggest videos for us to make. If you want to know more, please check on the link in the description below. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. I will see you next time for more Final Fantasy videos.